All right. So, hey, lots of faces I know. How's it going? Hey, Justin. <laughs> Who here has heard about salt before? Man, I love being in my hometown. <laughs> I mean, I was at... Uh, what was it? I was at the Open Source Business Conference a few days ago. It was Monday and Tuesday. And uh, I ran into like eight people who'd heard of salt. And I'm thinking, you guys need to get out more. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. That means I don't need to uh, talk about introductory stuff. That's also good because a lot of the talks today are um, not introductory talks on salt. Now, what I'm going to be talking about here to kind of kick off, we've got, uh, you know, there, there are two more talks on SALT and then you got to stick around for Aaron's talk on ZFS because ZFS is freaking awesome. <laughs> and so is Aaron. <laughs> You're awesome. But the, uh, what, what we're going to be, what I'm going to be talking about today is about SALT beyond configuration management. One of the really big problems that we run into is that a lot of people see SALT and they say, Oh, so it's, uh, it's just config management, right? It just competes with those other ones that are written in Ruby, right? And we're trying to explain, no, 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 no. It does a, config management's just a small part of what SALT does and what SALT is. And so a lot of what we're talking about here today is about how SALT is about building blocks. SALT is about having a system, an underlying system that gives you control and access and not that it is just a point solution. So let me start by talking about building blocks. Now you go back in the history of the world and technology is built layer on layer on top of earlier ideas, on top of earlier concepts. It's really easy to go back and um, talk about the fact that thousands of years ago people figured out agriculture. And since they figured out agriculture, this concept called a city could be built. And that really couldn't exist before. We go back and we see that people figured out mathematics. I mean, we go back and we talk about all of the math that came out of India and out of the Middle East and not out of our Roman ancestors because Roman numerals, I mean, that just sucks to do math with that. It doesn't work. And we talk about the evolution of language and what that means. And what it really boils down to is that the stuff throughout history that has endured are things that are building blocks things that we can build more on top of. They aren't ideas that were niche ideas that only worked in targeted situations. Those are all gone. They don't endure over time. And so that's why SALT is built the way that it is. So today, and especially pertinent to this audience here, the building blocks of modern technology is all about building out services, building out computational systems. I mean, we look at the vast majority of economic progress in, in the world today, and it really is all about saying that we, we've got data centers and they're full of servers and they're accomplishing jobs for us. They're doing tasks on our behalf. I saw, I saw a fantastic article the other day that was talking about why aliens wouldn't care about invading us. That we're, we're never going to talk to aliens because why would they care? And it was talking about the fact that 20 years ago, let's say I asked you how many feet earn a mile. Who here knows? Oh, that was good. I need a harder question. How many meters? How many meters? <laughs> but if you didn't know an an if you didn't know the answer to that question or be in a room filled with nerds <laughs> then how long would it take you to get that answer from conventional means 20 30 years ago you'd probably have to find a book 
and it would take you anywhere from a half hour to you might have to, you know, drive to a library. And so it's taking you on this order of many minutes to hours to find out that piece of information. You go back 10 years ago, how do you find out? Right, you would find a computer that had the internet, which was not necessarily the easiest thing to do. 10 years ago, that wouldn't have happened in this room. Okay, maybe 15 years. They had Wi-Fi. Not that that's necessarily gotten better. <laughs> okay. But so you'd need to sit down, you'd need to Google it, you'd need to go through search results. And so now instead of it taking a half hour, you'd be able to pull that sucker off probably in two to ten minutes. Okay, give or take how far away you are from the internet. Now if we needed to know, what do we do? We pick up a phone and we say to it, feet in a mile, it's that many. The progress of our society is all around data collection. I love the fact that we're now, what is it, 30 years since uh, Back to the Future 2 came out? <laughs> I love watching that movie and going, they really thought that room temperature superconductors was going to make it. Because that's, that's how you make levitating cars. <laughs> but it didn't, did it? And what's happened is that it's all about communication. It's all about data. It's all about computational services that do all of our work for us. This is what all of us are building all the time. And so the building blocks of the future are tools that are going to, us, to enable us to build these systems more efficiently. Now, one of the problems that we're running into is that these computational systems can get kind of complicated. We had a fantastic talk by H. Oh, I just... Hatfield, thank you. Right before this, talking about just scaling from two servers to six servers. And I was kind of chuckling in the back going, I wish those were the problems I had to deal with. <laughs> but the reality is, is that that function in and of itself, just from two to six, begins to get complicated. And it can begin to get complicated very, very quickly. And so the question is, is how do we create building blocks that aren't complicated, but are still powerful enough to do the underlying work? This is one of the problems that I think that we're seeing a lot in existing tools for infrastructure management. When you come out and you say, okay, I've got a tool for infrastructure management, it's gonna take me two months to set it up. Then this isn't an efficient building block. Your job is the creation of that high level service. It's the creation of the computational service. The goal needs to be for the building blocks to be something that can get out of your way. Something that is easy, something that is simplistic, but powerful. And so this is really the mental challenge, the mental approach that we're trying to take when developing SALT. <clears throat> it's like I missed resizing the text on this one. Now, it's all about simplicity. So let's look, at, let's look at Unix as an example. Unix or Linux under the hood and writing code for the Linux kernel, who here thinks that that is something that is a very simple and straightforward thing? <coughs> well, I'm really relieved that there weren't 20 hands that went up because I was in a room full of kernel developers. <laughs> but, Frankly, being presented with a shell and having some commands that you don't need to get very deep into, basically, hey, we edit files, they've got some permissions. The high level aspects of a Unix operating system, frankly, aren't overly complicated. 
It's become a complete commodity at this point. We just make one and there's a shell and we do whatever. We're done, right? I mean, the most complicated thing on most of these from a perspective of user interaction can be, be like the init system, which, don't get me started. But what happened inside of a good operating system is that they were able to create something powerful and frankly extremely complicated under the hood, but have veneers on top of it that are reasonable and usable. Okay? I think YAML is another great example of just being simple all in all. You go, well, there's data there. Sure, it helps logically if you understand what hash maps are, but you really don't need to. So, viable building blocks need to be simple on the top. They need to be things that a lot of people can understand quickly, they need to be things that people can get onboarded quickly, even though it can take them a long time to get into the depths of it. And we all know how long it's taken us to learn the intricacies of Linux and BSD and any other... Op I mean, I'm sure there's Haiku fans in here. I don't want to leave you out. The <laughs> but it's got to be something that people can onboard and get to know a little more quickly. Okay. And so the question is, is how do we create concepts of simplicity? How do we do that? So, it's all about creating interfaces that are simple, straightforward, and can be used independently as building blocks. Now, that's a big reason why it's called SALT. Now, granted, I've got a great story I tell people about how I was watching Lord of the Rings and I heard Gimli, son of Gloin, <laughs> say, Salted pork! And I thought, that's a good name. <laughs> but the reality is, is that it's a good name because salt is a building block. It's a building block that's simple. It's a building block that everybody in the world uses and understands. You put it in your mouth and it makes you happier. <laughs> Unless you put too much in your mouth and then your kidneys shut down. <laughs> Gotta mix enough water with that. <laughs> okay, but it is a building block. It's a building block in nature. It's a building block in cooking. It's a building block in how your bodies work. And that is what we're trying to build with salt stack. Is building blocks. And yes, that's why it's called salt stack. It's not that we're saying here is an explicit stack to use. We're saying here are things to stack. <laughs> I know it's kind of whatever. <laughs> and that was the original idea of the, of the logo. I don't think, is Lucas in here? I don't see him. Oh, figures. I was going to give him a shout out for making our logo. But no, he's seeing a movie that's more entertaining than Tom. <laughs> Granted, I'm sure that's not too terribly diff difficult. <laughs> There's a bunch of agreeing. I'm going to go see Iron Man. Okay. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> I have too much work to do. All right. So when we talk about going beyond configuration management inside of SALT, what I really want to talk about is the fact that to go beyond config management in SALT, you go before config management in SALT. You look at these core building blocks of the system and these core ideas. And then I'm going to talk about how these core ideas have been used to build all of the stuff on top of SALT and how they're being used to build more stuff on top of SALT and how they're being used to build stuff in such a way that it doesn't interfere with the other stuff. Okay? So that was a lot of stuff. So the core idea behind SALT is this concept of state and flow. It's the idea that if you can control the flow of your infrastructure, find out what's happening live, tell it to change things hot in large scale, 
or in small scale, then that's half of the picture. And that the other half of the picture is controlling the state of the infrastructure. And that is, what is the state of the systems that you've got set up? Now, a lot of people come back and I say, there's state, and we talk, you know, there's salt states and all this stuff. And they go, oh, that's config management. And the reality is, is that config management as a topic, as a whole, is really a combination of these two ideas. It's taking aspects of flow and aspects of state and merging them together. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that works and why it works. Okay? But that is the core idea. Flow plus state is everything. And so one of the best ways to understand salt, understand how it works, understand the philosophy behind it, is to understand this idea of flow and state. Okay? And those are my building blocks. So, I know I just said that it's built on both. I, I lied on the slide. <laughs> It was late last night. <laughs> okay. Remote execution is built on flow. I don't think of flow as SALT's remote execution system. Flow is just the communication channel. And that's why we use it in a lot of mediums outside of just remote execution. That's why flow is the backbone for SALT's event system and SALT's alerting systems. And flow is the backbone of SALT's reactor, which is the self-healing and alerting system inside of SALT. Okay? Config management is fundamentally built on state. It's 90% state. But the reality is, is that when you're doing real config management, if you're setting up one server, sure, it's built on state. Whoopity, I'm setting up one server. Frankly, one server is enough for salt. Usually you need at least three <laughs> before it starts being more practical. But you don't need very many. But config management is all about not only the state of that one system, but using flow to gather data and understand what's going on in many systems. It also ties into the fact that SALT's config management comes with the thing called the overstate. So most of you guys have heard about SALT. Who's heard about the overstate in SALT? There we go. See, there's stuff to talk about. <laughs> the overstate brings together the two ideas by allowing you to orchestrate the rollout of, the, of your configuration management across many, many systems. It allows you to say, we're going to stage out these servers, and we're only going to run this part of the config on them, and then we're going to do these servers, and then we can do more on these. And so it's really easy from the top to send out all of those commands to orchestrate the complete rollout of an infrastructure. We're seeing more and more and more people using overstate exclusively um, for their config management instead of salt. Now, as we ramp up and talk about all of these different components, and I'm going to start drawing and, you know, talking about how some of these things are built. We're going to see that it's all a combination of flow and state. I mean, orchestration, our our most widely used orchestration engine in SALT is the overstate. Um, distributed deployment. We can talk about deploying code using SALT. Cloud management. SALT can be used to build a cloud. Granted, it doesn't do everything that OpenStack does, but I know a lot of people who don't want to. SALT can be used to build a cloud, and frankly, we can have a cloud up in 10 minutes. Okay, if you have to install the OS on your hypervisors, you know, it might take an hour. Now, and the new monitoring systems, the backbone of which is coming in uh, not dot 15, which should be today. What were you going to say, Trevor? No, I just wanted to hear that. I was like, dang. No, I got a slide. Don't worry. <laughs> but so the emphasis here is SALT is not a configuration management s system. This is, this is classic object-oriented programming. 
It's a has a relationship, not a is a relationship. Okay? The is a relationship is salt is flow and state. And that allows it to have other components. Now, this is a really good way of thinking about salt because once you start understanding that that's how it's built, you begin to realize that those building blocks that are in salt can be used to do more powerful things targeted to your deployment, targeted to whatever the service is that you're building. And so the benefit there is that since it's based around building blocks, Understanding those building blocks means that salt can have a whatever you need it to have with respect to managing your infrastructure. And if we've got time, I'll give you some of the more crazy examples of things that have been built using salt for, uh, for the management. All right. So I'm going to walk through these, these components inside of SALT and talk about how they're built from a more logical perspective. Okay? Is there a... You know, it just occurred to me that I could really use a dry erase marker. It's interesting. That's as critical to communication as the Internet. <laughs> okay. So, the remote execution system inside of SALT... It's built on having a front end to the remote execution. Wow, I caught something. All right, I'm going to try this. What? Oh, okay. Okay, so remote X. So you've got salt, it's got a publisher in it. And it has an event system. Okay? And it has the return system. This is basically flow. So let's talk about these for a few more seconds. How SALT works is that, or the, how the remote execution in SALT works, or flow, is that the master server takes a command and makes it quite small, encrypts it, and publishes it out to the minions, and then the targeted minions execute the command. They pull it in, it's small, but it has all the information they need to know exactly what to, what to execute, and so, they execute it. When they're done executing it, it hop, hops into the return system. The return system in SALT is a modular system that allows it to say, okay, we're returning now. Should I go back to where my command came from? Or should I additionally go to wherever the devil you want it to go to? Because it's, it's a hinge. We have lots of hinges. And then once it gets back, once that gets back to the master, the master fires an event. And that's, that's flow. Now, remote execution means that there is a CLI front end, an event listener, okay, that listens to those events and then fires them. There's a caching system that allows you to cache, I can't write today, that allows you to cache all of those returns that have come in for a, for a period of time. Um, and then there's query systems, so historic queries. So basically, we take flow and we get remote execution by building on top of the fundamental building block. Okay? Does that make sense? Am I too boring? We're okay, and I can use more math in the next one. We're good? Okay. It's all about knowing the audience. You guys are a lot more fun than business guys. Okay. Now, states. So, 
States are actually, there's a lot of little squares I can draw. <laughs> so I won't go into too much extreme detail. And what I keep yammering to what, 20 after? Thank you. <laughs> so, state. This is built on state functions. And the execution routine, okay? Um, and state, the core state parser. All right, and there we've got state. For those of you who know pillar, for instance, pillar in salt, which isn't applying state to systems, is built on top of the state system. It literally uses the state system to, to build the pillar. Okay? Monitoring inside of salt, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is built on top of the state system. Okay. And so the core configuration management, yes? Can you explain a little bit what a state function is? Is that encapsulating the state of a minion or something like that? Yes. So a state function are the things that you write inside of salt's state modules. So a state function is a Python function. And those and so those state functions have in them the routine that does the check to see, hey, does this need to be set up? And then it returns a consistent piece of data to say what it's done. Okay? So does that answer your question? It does, thank you. Okay. All right. So on top of the core concept of state to accomplish configuration management, we built more building blocks. So the lowest one is called, and this is, this is where kind of, sorry, I kind of geek out. I really like this thing. With, I mean, I, I know I'm biased. I wrote it. But, <laughs> but we've got something that we call inside of the state compiler a low chunk. And low chunk is a, is a data structure that maps to the execution of a state function. Okay? And then above that, we have a low... Man. I think my hand's broken. I'm usually not this bad. I mean, really. So we've got a low state, which is just a list of low chunks. And so we're just talking about the data structures that we need. On top of a low state, we have high data, which is the data that you represent in YAML in SALT SLS formulas. Okay? So, one of the cool things about this approach is that since the underlying state platform is completely logically abstracted away from this, which is renderers, that means that it doesn't care how it gets its data. You can come and inject data here, or here, or here, or actually here, and the state system could care less. Sorry, I couldn't care less. And you're able to execute states. Okay? Now, the great thing there is that it makes it a fantastic building block. So, as a, as a quick representation or a quick uh, blah, explanation, renders up here is the language in which you represent high data in salt. And so, by default, for those of you who have seen it, it's just the YAML files, right? It's pretty straightforward, and I mean, that was the goal, to make it as straightforward as I could imagine. But let's say that you want to bring out a bigger gun. We have... We've got PyDSL. We've got, a, we've got a language that's been written on top of this. Logically, it's not that hard to do. PyDSL is only something like 300 lines of code. It's not complicated. 
I mean, if you wanted to, you can write as many languages as you want on top of salt, and we can have a language war about stuff on top of salt. I mean, logically, we could be writing these things in Lua. Actually, I bet Lua would be easier because I, it's Lua. It's awesome. But you get the idea. Now, this is also important when it comes down to um, more of... Uh, I went too far. Okay. It's also nice when this comes down to working with um, more complicated things inside of salt. And so some of the new things in salt and the direction where we're going in salt, these things work, although I will admit that they're a little on the young side. But SALT comes with a completely armed and operational cloud controller. And by armed and operational, I do mean the second Death Star. It's not quite done. <laughs> and this one's got an even larger hole where a whole ship can fly in and destroy it, not just an exhaust port. Okay. So this idea about SALT for cloud management. It really does a fantastic job of marrying state and flow. Because now it connects into, you know, I should have put another square here, which is the, the client lib. I'll be dirty and just shove it in there. So how it works is that instead of saying, all right, so you want a cloud, we're going to set up a database. And it's going to have stuff in it. We're going to set up 50 bajillion services on your hypervisors. We're going to set up, uh, God, I don't even know anymore. But you, you know what I mean. <laughs> you, some of you guys have done this. <laughs> okay. Instead we say, all right, it's a cloud system. It's completely encapsulated under the scope of SALT. And like SALT, it has no, ex no external dependencies. Sure, you can make external dependencies if you want. They're great for targeted use cases. But you don't need any to run SALT. So SALT itself, it's set up, it's on hypervisors. You, are, you basically have a cloud. So the only thing that you need to do on top of SALT to get the cloud is to realize some of these cloud building blocks. And so one is to make sure that your hypervisors are set up. That's frankly not very complicated. You just need to make sure you've got a bridged interface or some bridged interfaces. It comes with a default network config, but you can assign different network configs arbitrarily to virtual machines. Okay, it, it's built uh, right now, the implementation is built on top of libvirt and KVM because, I mean, that's the best one to build on top of. But we can obviously build back-end implementations. They are genericized, just like the package management system in SALT is genericized. And so we can build them in the future on top of any hypervisor that we'd like. Okay. But one of the things that we did inside of the cloud system, which I think is a really good representation of marrying these concepts, is the fact that um, in libvirt, if you want live migration of virtual machines or automated like migration of virtual machines. Who here wants to explain what you need to do to do that? Okay, who said that? Okay, one way is SSH keys. And so you end up building out shared SSH keys across all of your systems and then configuring the hypervisors so that they are communicating and sharing data across SSH tunnels. Okay, it's kind of, it can be kind of a pain to do. The other way that's built into libvirt, which allows for actually a little faster transportation, is to use um, PKI keys. So we built inside of SALT a system which automatically signs and distributes all of your libvirt PKI keys, which means that you basically have a single state in your state file that is three lines of YAML. And then it's going to ensure that that system is 
signed and authenticated with the same cert as everything else. When it comes time for you to refresh that certificate, all you've got to do is delete them on the master, run states again, it, the master will generate you a new certificate, distribute them all out, and you're good to go. So you have fully automated and distributed um, PKI keys for Libvirt automatically because we just put it on top of state and flow. It's, a, it's really a combination system. <laughs> uses some of both. Okay. But so the linchpin here is that we're able to solve some of these complicated problems. Actually, so like Dave and Joseph in there, they can attest to, I implemented the livered key distribution and then th once and threw it away. I was really upset that it would take two steps to set up. That's not acceptable. That's too many steps. We need just one. <laughs> Okay. All right. So back into talking about how cloud works. What it does is we use flow, remote ex and remote execution to communicate to the hypervisors and say, hey, tell me what's going on out there. They all return and say, here's where our virtual machines are. Here's what they're doing. Here's how big they are. Here's all the people, here's all the servers who are hypervisors. And then it says, ah, that took me a half of a second and I now know about my entire um, cloud infrastructure. We've actually got guys who have deployed other more complex clouds who use these query routines inside of um, Salt's cloud system or Saltvert as it's called to check to see how out of date their cloud databases are. I love hearing that. <laughs> okay. So it goes out, says, tell me everything about my cloud, comes back, bam, you've got the data. Salt's, uh, Saltvert reads in that data and says, okay, we know where we can deploy this virtual machine and it uses remote execution again. Send that information out. The target hypervisor spins up the virtual machine. Now. We have a lot of control over things. The target hypervisor has an option on it to be able to mount that virtual machine image before it comes up using libvirt or QMU network block devices. Mount that image and then seed the salt keys on it so that when it comes up, when it comes up, it's already authenticated back to the salt master and it can boot and start the config management routine on that virtual on that VM so that everything is tightly integrated. Now one of the things that I'm working on, we're working on, okay, I'm, I'm on this one, is that when we shoot that image, we'll actually be able to do the full configuration on the image before we ever boot that sucker up. So that you're able to boot up systems which never have that initial config lag, that they always come up hot. Also, it would be a, it's a system that would allow you to have a generic image and then create a bunch of cached images on the fly on a regular basis that are already pre-authenticated with the salt master, already pre-prepared and are just waiting for you to turn them on to actually do your scaling. Which means that it's really easy to say, we need to scale, how long is that going to take us? Well, frankly, it's going to take us 15 seconds because that's how long it takes to boot the VM. That's it. And bam, you've got more web tier. Okay? All right. So again, these are the things that we're doing with the cloud. It's based around the idea of running on live data, which we're feeling comfortable with because we're able to get live data and crunch it about hypervisors in environments of over, of over thousands of hypervisors. You just need to make sure you've got a little more RAM on your master. And by a little more, I mean like four to eight gigs. It's not like a lot. <laughs> and if you've got 10,000 hypervisors, I'm sure you can afford a salt master with eight gigs. <laughs> okay. 
But so it runs entirely on live data, is able to crunch that data quickly, is able to make decisions quickly, and that means that you don't have the problem of having data that you're relying on that's out of sync, and you don't have the problem of setting up all sorts of stuff because it's built on simple building blocks. Any questions, comments, arguments, rebuttals? Is that all within SALT itself? Okay, this is all within SALT itself. Now, I, I need to emphasize that if you're not using any of this, SALT doesn't turn it on. It automatically knows, oh, this isn't a hypervisor, I'm not even going to bother turning on virtualization components. So that they, they're just, they're not there if you, don't, if you don't use them. Again, one of the goals is that SALT is able to run, but it only wakes up what it needs to wake up to run your deployment. We never want the fact that it can do all sorts of fantastic things to get in, way of, in the way of the things that you're really doing. Okay, but yeah, that's all within SALT. Yes? So, I'm curious just about the architecture on, you said having the master being able to manage um, all the events that are coming in. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you're handling like when that is scaled up to huge numbers, like are you using multi-process or threading or some other, being able to scale out the master some way? Okay, we're, yeah. We're, we're using a combination of both and the ability to create distributed masters. So generally when we, when we look at infrastructures that get above, above the 10,000 mark, that's kind of a magic line when you start having to think about things at a much, much more serious scale issue. We, we see people using the syndic. And I should, I'll, I'll take a second here. Now the idea behind, I don't have an eraser. Hey Joseph, you have an eraser in your magic bag there? Oh yeah. I'm in a modern classroom. <laughs> okay, now this idea is you've got a master, okay, and it's got its too many minions, and another one, and you want them to cross communicate, you create a higher level master, okay, and you do that by using the system in SALT called the Syndic. And basically, what the syndic does is it listens on the event bus. So, which is basically the representation of all flow. Listens on the event bus and then creates packets of events every n seconds. The default is actually every half a second. But creates packets of events and then shoots those packets up. So that you can have 10,000 returns and they get packaged up once into a single return up here and then they are unpackaged in such a way that this guy sees it as if it were all these guys but it only has to deal with that single connection and throughput. Now with respect to threading and multiprocessing, um, if I were to describe the multiprocessing and threading operations that are happening on the inside of SALT, I would need another two hours. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, network connections are maintained inside of pthreads down, uh, down on the socket layer, okay? And then the function, the, the higher level functions that are happening inside of SALT all happen in separate, separate par processes on the operating system, to say it very quickly and succinctly. Which is, yeah, why it's made to be able to go, go big. And you can obviously tweak all of those numbers to say, how big are we going to allow this to get? Or rather, how many resources are we going to pre-allocate to handle the scope of the infrastructure I'm dealing with? Does that answer your question at least, at least enough? Yeah. Okay. So, I've got a few more minutes, so I'll talk about building monitoring. 
So monitoring is also very young. The, uh, all of the back-end systems for monitoring are in place as of 0.15, which again, barring any tragedy or uh, emergency, I should have that cut by the end of the day. Um, but the idea behind monitoring is that SALT's remote execution system already comes with system libraries that do data queries. I mean, they've been in there the whole time. And so it can already query all sorts of raw information about the system that you're running on. Great. All the, day, all the routines that we use inside of states are all part of Flow's backend executions. And so they can be reused very, very cleanly to gather monitoring data or gather state data to say, so are those services up? Yes or no? Okay. And so the back end works very similarly to states for the monitoring. And you define what you monitor using states. And so those, those states, you don't need to learn anything new. You just write a few more salt states that say, this is how we're going to monitor disk usage. Realize them on the systems that you want to monitor that scope of disk usage on. You give us some boundaries. And then when those fail in their monitoring state runs, instead of their config management state runs, when something in that fails, it comes back and fires on the event bus. The event bus firing goes into SALT's reactor system, which is the logic engine that says, should I do anything with this? Which means that the monitoring system can be made to tell SALT to do auto healing inside of the reactor. It's made to, or to be able to send off alerts. Or if we can find a good pizza ordering API, it could do that too. Because <laughs> I mean, frankly, uh, who here has been woken up at 2 a.m. and had to go into the data center? <laughs> I want a pizza there when I get there. <laughs> Paid for a soda. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I'm just saying that we need to build the pizza ordering system in. <laughs> okay. And so the monitoring systems inside of SALT are based around, again, using the routines and powers that we have in Flow and using the state system for you to declare what it is that you're monitoring, using the return system inside of Flow so that all of that long-term data can go and get cached in a database somewhere so that you can easily and cleanly look it up and get all of your historic records and also using Flow with respect to the reactor system. Okay? Is that my last one? Yeah. I told you I really did write this like before we started. Or the, this slide. All the others were done. <laughs> okay. Now, that pretty much wraps up my presentation. I'm sure that I, that, and, and this, is, this is the first time I've tried one that's really abstract, high level, and fast, and covers lots of weird things. So be nice. Um, but, is there, but does anybody have any questions? Okay, I've got a sharp question here. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so what do we, I have salt brought up already, but uh, I'm curious for, uh, and I know it's out there, I know it's an available thing to run a dual master configuration. Uh huh. But what are the best standards and practices for, for that type of arrangement? Because I am, you know, slowly trying to wrap my head around it. I don't want to have to redo anything that I had up and running. Um, but I was curious, is, is, I, I know that I, I probably should ask the community better. But, um, I can answer it very quickly. Go straight to the top. <laughs> Okay, um, the question is, can you build, can you have multi-master with SALT? Now, the, uh, the answer is yes, you definitely can have multi-master with SALT. Um, the only caveat is that it really isn't, it isn't built in, so you've got to use some external stuff. Uh, but the thing to do is to just set up a VIP between the two masters, and then you need to take care of uh, sharing the master's private key within the two, okay? 
and that's uh, yeah, and that's in the PK, that's in the PKI directory, Etsy Salt PKI Master. <clears throat> so you've got to share the, that key with the two, and you've got to make sure that your accepted minion keys, which are in that directory as well, the minions public keys that are accepted, are also shared. Um, and then your minions attached to the VIP and you're good to go. You can fail the one, the minions will TCP keep alive, re reattach to the second. And uh, yeah, and so you've got high availability of the master. Now we are looking at, um, and have been looking at, building multi-master support directly inside of SALT so you don't need to monkey around with a VIP and shared files. Uh, oh, the other thing is that you've got to make sure, that, or you want to make sure that your second master has all of your state files copied over as well. And so, you probably the best way to do that is use GitFS. So, because then it, they're just being cached on both of them, so that they're just hot all the time. And since they're cached on both of them, if the Git server goes down, you're still fine in the failover situation. So, wouldn't this on the board help fix that, or is this, this? something different then? Yeah, this is scaling out to, you know, generally this is like one data center, this is another data center. So why, like, why, why would having, what's the difference? Oh, fail? Okay. Yeah, if, if this went away, these are gone, okay. or we can't get to them. Whereas if we had a second one with a VIP, then they would all reattach, and this could have a syndic back up, and then when it and then this guy is just not reporting stuff back to the master because nothing's hitting its bus because it's not hot yet, and so it doesn't create redundant reports. Okay. All right. There's another question. Yes. Uh, being a managed service provider, um, like sometimes we when we get new clients, we'd like to be able to um, like pull a lot of information from. Them. Possibly we have a state file with uh, certain things we can check. Is there any way to do like a mash list? Like uh, just like put a file on the server, grab a lot of information from the server, and like um, mm -hmm. do something with the data? Yes. So, what's the question? Basically, can you run config management uh, masterless? Right. Just like a put a file on the server, grab information from that server. Yeah, basically when you do config management, you're starting up, uh, you're actually starting up higher than this, which is called the high state. And logically, you're just going directly to this lower le level. But the way you do it is um, by basically saying dash dash local on assault call command. So check that out. Okay, I've gone over, oh, we're just going into lunch. So I'm not insulting anybody by still talking. <laughs> All right, any other questions then? Master Topons? With state, is there a function in Lunch called the Truffle Shuffle? I'm sorry, called the what? <laughs> the Truffle Shuffle? The truffle shuffle. I didn't get that joke. <laughs> Cody? They make him do the truffles. His name is <laughs> There's a cultural reference that apparently I'm unaware of. <laughs> I will go look this up. <laughs> Geek status has been removed. I know. <laughs> Can somebody call my phone so the TARDIS goes off and I get a few points back? Aaron would like to hear me straight <laughs> okay, any, any other questions? So, I know you said monitoring is, is pretty, it's still in this young state. How, because right now at work we don't have any consistent monitoring stuff set up. Okay. So, um, um, you know. I've, how close is it? Yeah, how close. Okay, so let me give you a quick overview of where it's at, and then you can decide how much work needs to be done. <laughs> so right now we've only got a couple of uh, only like two state modules that are explicitly for monitoring. Um, it, it is basically directly plugged on top of the remote execution. Um, and so right now you would just put inside of, the, inside of the minion scheduler to do your monitoring runs on a regular basis and point them back to a returner. So, so the things that we're missing is really UI heavy. 
We don't have the UI with all the charts and pretty graphs and stuff. Um, so that's missing. Um, the other thing that's missing is just we need more states, uh, we need more monitoring states. So following up, those of us that are addicted to cacti for monitoring uh -huh. returns, if the returner output's there, I can just immediately have that straight dump, straight to cacti. That should be fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, yeah, yeah. We uh, Probably the best thing for us to do there would build a returner that transformed the data into cacti data and then you'd be able to just view it. Because I'm sure that there's a data structure in consistency. Right. But yeah, that, that would be very doable. And we've actually got a lot of guys who are, who are using salt monitoring directly with uh, tools like Carbon. Um, there's a great blog post actually out there um, by a guy named Tor Havim. Um, I'm sorry, Tor, if I said your name wrong again, if you ever watch this. <laughs> um, who, uh, yeah, it's T-O-R-H-V-E-E-M, and you Google that, you'll find it. Uh, but yeah, his blog describes how he's put it together using, uh, so it's a purely salt monitoring system. Um, his system doesn't plug back into the reactor. It's just a visual, this is what's going on. Yeah, so you don't want to have that graphs that yeah. really slick, and yeah, that was where Yeah. Salt only too. So that is very close. We do have people today who are using the cloud system, despite the fact that it's pretty young. Speaking of UI, if you guys know anybody who's a JavaScript madman who wants to help write open source awesome UIs, then please let me know. Because who wouldn't want to work for an open source company that's really cool and, yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good at that whole self-promoting thing. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, start clapping. <laughs> Thanks, guys.